seven o'clock p.m. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for making time for this additional meeting um, in your schedule. So uh, we're gathered today on the traditional unceded territory of Coast Salish, um, Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil um, peoples. And actually, it's the in year of Indigenous languages. So I thought that was an interesting piece to share with the acknowledgement that with language, as we know in schools, that's a big part of um, knowledge, education, communication, identity. And so this is a year to celebrate Indigenous languages in particular, to appreciate their contribution and also contribute to their growth and sustainability. So um, with that, um, I'm Jennifer and I just wanted to do a quick round of introductions um, after I um, say a little bit about meeting decorum. Um, just to ensure that we all can respect each other's space tonight and make sure we have room for everyone to feel heard um, and to contribute to discussion. So um, in this meeting, like other meetings at the board, um, we have a strong commitment to ethical conduct and that includes the responsibility of all members here to conduct themselves in appropriate decorum and professionalism. So as chair of the committee, um, it's my pleasure to make sure that this decorum is maintained. Myself and um, Rob Schindel will make sure that um, we can do our best to hold ourselves accountable as well. And so to that end, all members and delegates are requested to speak through the chair, um, as well to exercise civility towards each other um, as stakeholder representatives and trustees share their perspectives, participate in debate, um, that staff are able to submit objective reports without influence or pressure as their work is also acknowledged and appreciated, um, that committee members refrain from personal, inflammatory, accusatory language or action, and finally that members, trustees and representatives conduct ourselves in a professional and courteous manner. So if we're okay with that. I'll just start with introductions over here. Thank you, Jennifer. Rob Schindel, Associate Superintendent. Lindsay Louie, Recording Center. Anna Hamaguchi, Director of Instruction, Learning Ser Learning Services. Magdalena Cassis, Director of Instruction, School Services. Lois Chan Pedley, Trustee. Archander Sandu from Bethel. Jennifer is a Trustee and Board of Chair. Here's Trustee. Shelby Coleman, VSTA Rep. Darren Terraposki, Vesta. Amanda Hillis, DPAP. Alan Wong, trustee. Carmen Show, trustee and committee member. Hazel Fagi Lina, student trustee. Suzanne Hoffman, superintendent. Mark Parrott, uh, trustee and committee member. <laughs> Jody Lang, <Lengua, laughs> <associate superintendent. laughs> oh, Sorry. Sorry. Shazad Song, the assistant secretary treasurer. Gianna Chow, communications manager. Uh, David Nelson, deputy superintendent. Super. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and yep. Sorry, still not ready. Yep. Adrian Thank you so much, um, and thank you and welcome to our uh, guests as well as delegations and individuals um, here and online. Um, I also want to let folks know that the meeting, um, as other meetings, are being live streamed, and the audio and visual recordings of meetings are available to the public after the meeting um, has taken place, um, and the footage may be viewed inside and outside. Of Canada and microphones do work. They're live, they're on, so they could also pick up private conversations and should be turned off when not in use. But in this case, they're always on because we can't turn them off. So <coughs> just to be aware of that. Um, so we're starting, we've got three delegations on the agenda tonight um, and that's it. So um, the three uh, delegations include Band and Strings Programming presented by Rob Ford, followed by BC Ed Access Interim Report by Galen Hutchinson. Um, and finishing with All On Board by Vivica Ellis, and each delegation will receive 10 minutes um, to present their <coughs> research and report, followed by question and answer by each one. So we'll start with welcoming Rob Ford for Band and Strings Program. Hey there. Um, it's been an interesting evening. I was at the other meeting. That was pretty exciting. Um, so I'm changing gears. So we're talking the arts. How do we, is there a process for, who do I uh, nod to change the slide? Don't change it yet. Oh, is it up there? Can I just, oh, there's a clicker. Absolutely fabulous. Thank you so much. It gives me something else to fidget with. Um, Okay, I'm Robert Ford. I'm the uh, Hudson Elementary PAC Chair. Um, I have a daughter in grade 12 at Kitsilano Secondary, a son at Henry Hudson in grade five. My wife is the uh, choir director um, for uh, choirs at Trafalgar Elementary, Hudson, Lord Tennyson, as well as the piccolo conductor for the Vancouver Bach Children's Choir. I'm an IT guy, so uh, we'll get to the jokes later about why the heck I'm doing this presentation, but uh, we'll carry on. 
Um, what I'm here for, though, so that we're um, on point here, is the restoration of the <coughs> school board elementary band and strings program that failed to make the budget cut in 2016. Now, I'm going to do an analogy thing here. Imagine you're going to teach someone how to play soccer. Now I'm going to tell you, you can't let them play a game or see a game played. That is my analogy for where we're at with music education in the elementary process. So there we go. Oops. So this graphic here is from the BC curriculum website. Uh, arts education, I, this isn't exact, I had to squish it a bit, but experiencing art is what that fourth ball talks about. And I've modified it to say we are not here. Art experience has two pieces for children. You're either doing the art, in this case playing music or performing music, or you're receiving, you're on the receiving end, you're listening to it. So. You could say uh, my kids, um, my son's uh, group went to the symphony, which is really cool. But if you're there and you hear James N's violin or Yo-Yo Ma on the cello, it is so far ahead of where these guys are. It's just an experience that isn't grounded in something they can get. So my question is, how do you know excellence if you don't know where excellence starts? And with the kids, it has to start with them in elementary school because we don't have that many options. So last year started a petition that said, ask the school board trustees <coughs> to restore elementary band to pre-2016 cut level and put in a five-year plan to provide equitable access to band and strings. The challenge is, and I'm going with the people behind me, is I'm a project manager, resourcing, budgeting, all that stuff. There's no way you could get a full band string program in under five years, but I think you should look that far ahead. Now, this petition also talks about a choral program. I have another idea, but it has nothing to do with the budget. It has to do with an after school thing. I'm coming back later. We'll talk about that one later. Because I, as I, I, Jennifer, oh, and I forgot to thank Jennifer and Lois. Thank you so much for encouraging me to come here tonight. Uh, it, it made a huge difference because it's fairly nerve wracking. <laughs> so obviously we're gonna have funding issues. We can't solve all these here, but I wanted to talk about why this is important in a slightly more personal way. Now, I need to double click on this if it was on a computer. Can anyone do that? For the, um, oh wait, before you do that, <laughs> hold that pose, sorry. Uh, I got a, a bit more backstory before this video, hopefully, uh, and audio works. <clears throat> My daughter picked up the oboe in grade six at Hudson, and she picked the oboe as her instrument because it was the only one she could make a noise out of. And I, she's 17, she's got an oboe that is more expensive than any vehicle I've ever owned. And she's going off to university for music and it started at elementary school with her making horrible noises out of the oboe. So she didn't mind making horrible noises out of the oboe because she was with her peers. Some were close friends, some were just uh, buddies in the thing and they had a laugh. Now, if you wait till high school, it's much more self-conscious to make horrible noises. Trust me, I did it with a trumpet in grade nine back east. So let's see if we can get this going and, and we'll see if it double clicks, it should connect to the internet. If not, uh, technology ain't it grand. Uh, can we open it in um, PowerPoint itself? Are we on a Mac? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, right click. Oh, sorry, we cannot play this media object. Please upgrade your operating system. Oh, for crying out loud. All right, never mind. Newport. Yeah, it sucks. 
it on YouTube? Can you go to, oh, yeah, but that'll take too long. Uh, it's actually, if you edit the, um, let's try one thing. If we right click, if this was a PC, we should be able to look at the settings of this uh, embedded video. So, uh, action settings. Dang. Well, it's music performance. So, it's a minute of oboe music followed by three or four seconds of silence. And um, I'm going to email this to you. Yeah. Jennifer, if you can pull the thing out and send it to everybody, that'll make sense. And it is so rough to imagine that kids don't get a chance to do this. So let's power, let's power on to the next slide. Um, if you want to hit me back to the presentation, if you say play from start, I'll just click around or play. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Benefits of music performance. One of the things that makes me <coughs> emotional, considering I'm an old white guy, is three people I know use music performance that they started in elementary school where they learned be it voice, guitar, whatever, to help their mental health conditions, which range from good old fashioned anxiety to hallucinations to body dysmorphia. They need these tools to help themselves and to help others. So when one child wrote a song about body dysmorphia, it was much older in the high school years, the support that child got from the other kids was huge because they were able to express themselves and they expressed in a way that got their emotions in there and then they got the feedback back and people I did not know this was a big problem for you until you expressed yourself in music so second benefit the high school programs are going to suffer if we don't send them some kids from elementary who have a clue of what they're doing so and we've seen it at kids where there weren't enough kids coming in and Kids Pack is working on trying to restore their band and strings. They also had budgetary constraints and they had to pick between different programs. So Kids has a pretty strong drama program, not as strong a music program. I see it starting to change now, but there you go. Local economy, and you think, well, what could the local economy have to do with any of this? Well, if children aren't seeing music <laughs> at its beginning, this is the audience. These are the kids who are forced into the gym, and we're now going to uh, give you all painkillers, and you're going to listen to the, the school band. And you hear them, or the school orchestra, and they pound away at the instruments, and they squeak out something. It's actually pretty impressive when the, the, the band teacher says, by the way, these guys started with nothing. So they... You are not curating players, you're curating an audience who will go to local shows. Now, my wife in Vancouver Bach Bar used to be on their board. Getting an audience is tough. The people coming out of the school system don't know, there's a joke, one piano teacher I know, don't know a quarter note from a hot dog or a violin from a two-toed two sloth. So they don't have enough background to appreciate what's going on. So we're shortchanging our arts economy. So let's go on to the next one. Uh, next steps. Uh, one more minute. One more minute. Okay, good. I'll be fast. This is fantastic. This is the budget item that didn't make it in 2016-17. <coughs> so it was almost $400,000 estimated at that time. That's kind of my ask. And plus a working group, I don't quite know the ins and outs of the school board, but I think a working group that cross functions to figure out how do we expand it? How do we get it without breaking the bank to get it to more kids? Because it's not fair to have only certain schools there. So um, this slide, I'm assuming everybody has this because uh, yeah, I've been at this a long time. So someone sent this to me when I asked nicely, but I'm gonna end off with, here's my delegation. A couple of us are here. Delegation members, put up your hands. Yay, <laughs> a bunch aren't, but uh, said, no, put my name on here because this is important. Now, is this impossible to fund? 
Henry Hudson Elementary has a playing field that survived the rains. We got slit field drainage. Oh my God, we are so happy. I cannot express to you how thrilled we are that the kids can use it. We want to shoot all the local dogs. I'm sorry to use an aggressive term, but they dig the thing up. So we just had maintenance. Uh, Jim Machino's not in this thing. His eyes would be rolling like crazy. Um, so we're trying to figure that one out, but we have space. That funding was through the annual facilities grant through the province. We have a portable. That money came through the province. Guess who set the curriculum to have arts experience? That would have been the province. We have to get them on board, either money-wise or resources or what have you, so that we can do that. Now, normally <coughs> questions, I'd say, do you have any questions? But I actually don't know that much. I have questions for you guys. What's the process for getting this considered for the budget? And how do we get a working group together? Those are my two questions over to you. You may not have answers, but I'm officially done the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rob. Thank you so much, um, Rob Ford, for the presentation on Bad and Strings. So we'll open it up for questions, comments, dialogue. Oh, sorry. I'm being coached by my D-pad. So I think we can bring forward one of the questions about how to get this into the budget process. Do we want to jump to that? Shazad, would you like to ask questions around the budget process? Yeah, so there'll be um, some budget consultation meetings that are coming up um, February, March in time to get ready for budget uh, 1920. Um, and come forward there, or trustees can also uh, bring it forward to the Thank you, Can I ask a question related to that through the, through the chair? Um, does it, is it effective, like I'd like a, one of the trustees to bring it forward, but do, if there's an interested group, like our little delegation comes forward and and offers to speak and talk to the importance of that, does that help? Is that normal? I'm sorry about my ignorance of the process, but. Uh, through the chair, yeah, there, there will be a process where um, we'll have a public consultation where um, there'll be delegations coming forward and bringing budget proposals forward for consideration. And then it all gets, it, you know, it comes up to the board for final approval and decision. Just time management planning. Thank you. Other questions or comments? <coughs> Jen? Um, I'm wondering if there is any, uh, where we are <coughs> as a district, is there any work being undertaken around uh, elementary music um, by staff or contemplated? Sorry, I didn't hear the full question. Do you mind just repeating that? If there's any way for is 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 the district already uh, thinking about um, elementary music programs within the district? I, I, I'm just having a hard time hearing. Is was it the question? Is, is staff looking at elementary music programs? Is there so any work already being done in that area? Yeah, we're just in the process um, of uh, doing a review of the existing programs within the district. Uh, there'll be a questionnaire going out tomorrow uh, for schools to fill in. So um, that survey will be live for a week. And uh, then we'll pull it with that and we get there and take it from there. So we're just going to get a snapshot of what actually exists in the district right now. Hey, through the chair, I have a question um, regarding how to get this in process. Part of what I understand is there's stuff in the collective language that makes it more of a prep sort of opportunity. Is that being negotiated for June? <clears throat> David Nelson? So through the chair, I think discussion of collective agreement proposals wouldn't be appropriate at a public meeting, so I think we can best say no comment on that. Just for follow-up through the chair, is there a way around it that doesn't make it a prep process that doesn't involve collective agreements? Perhaps we can take that question away and get an answer 
a proper answer with Carmen um, Batista, our employee services as uh, assistant superintendent. So I'm question with her follow-up. Thank you. Sure. I've got bar. Sorry, are you asking if music has to be provided by a prep teacher? My understanding, sorry, through the chair is that um, with the teacher is a teacher for the elementary level with no specialists and stuff that if they want to have in the I know um, smaller schools anyway, it's prep time that's mostly used for music or, or for whatever the school decides that is important for them for prep time. So it could be other things more like resource or mm -hmm. um, PE instruction or other sort of instruction along those lines. There's nothing in the collective agreement that stipulates that, that. that's a staff decision how to use that person. Yep, through the chair, it's just my idea. We're trying to get this to be equalized across the district so that every school can have music. <coughs> I'm wondering about the process for that that would make it so it wasn't always prep time so that they'd be losing out on something else. So it sounds like, Suzanne, you're I'll willing to take it away follow-up. Thanks, Amanda. Um, other questions, comments? On the round? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Rob, for taking the time to share your passion. Please send the video so we can share it out um, yes. and enjoy it. Okay. Thanks yeah. so much. And Have a good I'll evening. All those up to come. Thank you. So next on the agenda, we have Galen Hutchinson for BC Ed Access with an interim report. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this presentation was created by the BC Ed Access Society, which is an organization of 600 parents who have and families who have complex learners and children with disabilities all across British Columbia. And the BC Ed Access uh, society is a nonprofit society that has been in operation for approximately five years. Uh, I found BC Ed Access when uh, it became clear that my little people, one of my uh, short little people, due to chronic systemic underfunding, was being put at risk because of her complex learning needs. So my name is Galen Hutchinson, and I've got three little kids in our public education system. And today I want to walk through the BC Ed Access Interim Report on our Exclusion Tracker. So we are a grassroots organization that has grown organically over the past since its inception, since 2014. And the work ranges from supporting individual parents to advocate for resources in their classrooms to lobbying different levels of government to affect change. So one of the biggest and most common problems that our parents told us time and time again was that their children were being excluded from schools. And so because of this, we developed an online tool that enables parents to log in and record when and where and how their kids are missing school. So we're tracking incidents of student exclusion because it's the most widely cited issue in our group. And we want to know how and why and where our students are excluded from school so we can work together collaboratively, collaboratively to find solutions for change. So we just want to acknowledge quickly that uh, there have been some concerns by staff and administration who might feel criticized or singled out by data collection. And we just really want to underscore that our organization is trying to have exclusions recognized as a systemic organizational issue that involves all <coughs> sorts of change on multiple levels. It's multi-layered and there's not, there's not one person or one reason for this reality. Uh, without identifying and recognizing the problem, we cannot find appropriate solutions for change. So uh, our intent is to communicate the experiences of families and students and to encourage districts to track their own data and implement their own solutions. So who's using our tracker? So we have the, had 2,500 individual exclusions documented since September 4th of this year, 2018. 
And the vast majority of our users are from the public school. This is somewhat surprising because the overall independent school enrollment is 12.9% of all students in British Columbia. So data has been tracked from all the designations and from a majority of the school districts. And many individuals are reporting multiple experiences of exclusion, multiple days of exclusion, uh, time and time again. Uh, what you're looking at, the most significant one that stands out for me, of course, is the 26.5% for a full day of exclusion. But the other category, that is 28.9%, is uh, about exclusion being an ongoing issue for families. And so to be clear, um, we are not data scientists. This is not a perfect traffic tracking tool. It's just the beginning stages in the hope to sort of garner information. It's our hope that people who go further will develop a much better tool to find the data that will really help the kids uh, and teachers and parents who are experiencing exclusion. So some of the examples of exclusion cited are kids who are not allowed to attend school all day because their EAs are unavailable or are balancing too many uh, needs in the school. Perhaps they're excluded from attending a field trip unless they have a parent accompanying them. They may be excluded from extracurricular activities. And at the end of the day, what the bottom line is, is that complex learners and children with disabilities are excluded because there are not enough funds to support full-time care and the proper expertise of educators who will support their learning needs. One of the other things that arose out of our research is, in fact, there's this misunderstanding that um, schools can sometimes claim that these exclusions are agreements between parents. And in reality, parents comply for several reasons. So first of all, most parents do not know that they have the right to refuse, that refusal is even an option for them. And secondly, many parents feel forced into agreeing into an exclusion. Parents are concerned about their children's safety, and they will often readily agree to exclusion because the school cannot guarantee their children's safety. And finally, and I know this is certainly my experience, ultimately parents want to work collaboratively with the school, even at the expense of home and work and other obligations. So I have a very good working relationship with the teachers and administration at my school, and it became very clear um, that really great teachers and really great administrators were working as hard as they possibly could to support the needs of the kids in their school. And they just didn't have the tools, the resources, the staff, and they just couldn't do the job. So as someone who wants to invest in that relationship over a long term, I have three kids, I absolutely get why they are struggling. And we all need to work together to build a solution to help all the kids in all the schools across the province. Perhaps surprisingly, more than half of the people surveyed, in fact, the EA was present. So it's not that they didn't have, it wasn't solely a staffing issue. And what this really underscores is that the majority of the time, the regular staff are present and they still don't have what they need to support these students in a meaningful way. It really speaks to the need for more staff, more specialists to support teachers, and better staffing ratios for support staff. Another uh, issue that came up time and time again was the issue of physical restraint and seclusion. So this is a bit stark because across British Columbia, kids are being restrained and secluded and are not receiving access to their education. And the part that's most concerning for many parents is this 20% not sure factor because for many parents, some parents, their, their children are nonverbal, so they have no way of knowing what's going on without uh, a good collaborative relationship with staff. So what parents are saying is that children are not getting equitable access to education. Exclusions matter because it is discriminatory to treat a child differently because of their differences and disabilities. Funding is not an excuse. Safety is not an excuse for regularly excluding students. Everyone else's ease and comfort is also not an excuse. 
It's also really important to note that chronic absences can lead to significant challenges in a, children, in a child's future. So the good news is that Victoria and North Vancouver are already starting to track this data. And we ask you to consider making a motion to do the same. They've also started implementing some of these solutions and other districts have as well. Just read off a couple of them, but to identify students with higher support needs who are being sent home, to have multiple EAs trained to properly support each of these students, to only have backup EAs placed with students who are flexible in terms of having a different EA. And so this speaks to relationship and trust and attachment. When staff absences occur, only deploy a trained, familiar replacement. Providing training to administration and leadership about inclusive supports and de-escalation techniques is critical. And this one's really important. Have a board certified behavior analysis or someone qualified to perform a functional behavior analysis on staff at school. If you don't know how you're doing, you don't know how you can prove. And across the province, the schools really need to address some of these questions. And we're wanting to encourage staffing other specialists like speech and language and OTs and other support services for wraparound care for families and students. One more minute. So there are lots more solutions, um, but I want to be clear that this is not a school problem. It's not a principal or administration problem. It's not just a district problem. It's a provincial problem as well. It's an everybody problem. And we all need to work together to fight for the rights of all our students, and particularly our most vulnerable. So these are some of the suggestions that BC Ed Access have proposed directly to the Minister Rob Fleming to hire EAs as career professionals, salary full-time work with prep time, have province-wide EA standards, increase teacher training prep time and mentorship for new teachers and teachers learning new skills, and in particular to respect the role of relationships and familiarity. We're really clear from a, an educated, a, educated perspective that kids who are not socially emotionally regulated, who don't feel safe, or whose needs are not being met are not available to learn. So that continuity of staff and best fit is critical for the success of all our students everywhere. If you have any more questions, please do check out the website, uh, www.bcedaccess.com. It's an incredible resource to pass on to other parents in your community who are looking for support. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Galen, for that research and information presentation. So we can open up for questions and discussion. Um, what is what is um, what's the definition of, of exclusion? Obviously, if a child's been sent home for a day, that's exclusion. But some of the things said five minutes. So would that would ex it be exclusion if the child was put in a desk in the corner? Would that be exclusion? Um, are you talking about seclusion? Like, uh, are you talking about the seclusion and restraint slide? Um, or excluding the big circle that you had that right. had days and yeah so there are it's it's sophisticated there are many different ways people can be uh excluded even having the materials not available for them they're they're there in body but they're not able to actually do the work is an example of exclusion they're physically there they're present but they're just kind of biding time because their educational needs are not being met and we can uh, put forward a, a long list of different ways. We've heard from many parents uh, across across British Columbia, many different ways their kids are being excluded. Thank you. Baron? Uh, yeah, through the chair, I'm just wondering, um, on the chart it talked about um, sometimes the child is excluded because the EA or student support worker is unavailable. And I'm just wondering in our district, um, what staffing is like currently for the uh, SSWs or the education assistants, whether like all the positions um, or if there's postings out there, if they're unfilled, and also in terms of the um, EOC list in terms of callouts, if there's unfilled callouts, so that um, if, if that's happening or currently. Thank you, Thanks. <laughs> to the chair. Um, Carmen actually has done a recent presentation, so I don't have her stats, and I think all of our trustees were uh, privy to her presentation, so I don't have all of Carmen's stats, and I'm not going to pretend that I can speak to that. Um, we have, uh, on a daily basis, we have uh, SSAs, unfilled positions due to absences, due to uh, shortage in SSAs, but the SSA shortage is not just 
per person in Vancouver. It's sometimes people who just choose are unable to or don't want to work or have jobs in more than one place. So there's a range in Vancouver on any given day and it's usually based on absences. Um, so I, I can't give you a day to day. We have days where we're, we're short as many as you know 50 SSAs, but we're not sending students home as a result of that. Students, as you're probably well aware, Darren, in your school, um, students are, our goal is not to send students home because of a lack of an SSA support. So we actually encourage that principals have contingency plans around how they can support. And that includes everything from an administrator being the SSA for the day to a resource teacher to depending on, on the needs of the students, looking at pulling from other schools. And in some instances, in particular this year, we've actually had an additional teacher placed in a few of the situations so that they have the additional staffing. So we, we're, we've come up with, with and continue to work on developing a range of sort of strategies to meet the needs of or the lack of needs sometimes on a day-to-day -day basis. Shelby and Darren. Um, through the chair, um, so I just sort of to piggyback on um, the, the idea of uh, um, sometimes there's been another teacher in the room. Um, we uh, have sort of started the conversation where there's um, certain classes with very complex learning needs um, the and it's leading to a lot of teacher burnout. Um, the idea of, well, what if there were two teachers in those those classes? So I know that um, the uh, board is doing uh, conducting surveys um, on the various programs that um, may be dealing with classes with very complex uh, learning needs. Um, and uh, we'll, we're interested to see what the results are. And we're also planning on um, surveying our members as well. Um, but so we talk about uh, training um, and uh, having more EAs, but th could that also be a potential um, solution is adding extra <coughs> teachers in the classroom? Yeah, I'm just wondering if the presenter is thinking of um, uh, presenting your data to um, MLAs or provincially in some way to um, advocate for funding and, and whatnot. Yeah, so BC Ed Access is, is do, doing this presentation in as many districts as possible. We're looking to do it throughout the province. Uh, we've already done it in several places and have had several meetings with the minister and continue to do so to advocate for all of these things on behalf of you. Can I follow up? Sure, there. I just want to mention that um, FESTA has policy about inclusion as well as the BCTF and um, we're really committed to the inclusion of all students mm -hmm. and um, you know as part of our policy we um, talk about that the ministry needs to provide appropriate funding to ensure proper supports are in place uh, for all special needs students <coughs> and their teachers which you know include in service for teachers and um, in, the, in October the BCTF uh, made a brief to the Select Standing Committee on Finance and Government Services and they made three recommendations around special needs and, and support for successful inclusion and one of them was that the Ministry of Education aligns special education funding with special education needs closing the current gap between what school districts receive in special education funding and the much greater amount that they spend on special education. So, and um, introducing per student funding amounts for high incidence designations, including children with learning disabilities and those that require moderate behavior support. I might just add to that, it, it's not just students or just parents or just communities. It's also this profoundly affects teachers and burnout and our whole community. It's, you know, often, um, you know, it's a multi-tiered layered system that is, is dysfunctional when it comes to true inclusion for a lot of these kids. And it's going to take every level of government um, to make the difference that we need. I have one. Um, so Mike, thank you so much, Galen. Um, I'm wondering too, maybe more generally, um, what would be the process to um, explore inclusion of EAs and the other specialized folks that you'd mentioned um, in the presentation uh, in a budget process? How, how would that occur? Maybe Shazad? Yeah, I think it would be it would be the same as the um, responding to the balance strings. It would all be during the budget proposal process. 
and uh, there'll be opportunity to come as present a delegation to the full board and then uh, again through the trustees proposals can come forward I might just add it's, it is our hope that uh, through the trustees through the chair that there will be a motion to begin to track this data in your own way because then once you find out where the challenges are you can start to really apply uh, the solutions whether they're EAs or any number of combinations of things that will be most effective for impacting change uh, through the chair uh, we do track uh, our exclusions. Uh, we do track right now the number of students who have missed days as a result of a shortage of, of SSAs. Um, that's the, the biggest one. We also track um, students that have been restrained. We actually don't uh, support a seclusion policy. Our trustees years ago made the decision not to support seclusion. So we actually do use uh, restraint, but it's we have a lot of processes in place and we actually reviewed our policy last year as per the ministry requirements and we do have a tracking document that we use as well. So those are just currently in place for us and you'll hear more about that when we come and do our special education presentation. You're getting a workshop from us but I don't think it's till March. Is that can I ask, is that something that BC Ed Access is aware of? Um, we, we'd love to see more of that. Uh, I guess what has become clear to us is a, a more expansive definition of what exclusion actually means. If parents don't even know that they um, that they can say no, that my, my student needs to stay in school and that's a school responsibility. Again, parents are sort of agreeing to take their kids and they don't even see it as exclusion. So really having an understanding of, of what exclusion actually means and that these kids uh, are are not having equitable access to, to education. And it's, it is being missed in lots of ways because everyone's doing the best they can with a broken system and we wanna make sure that we plug those holes and that doesn't happen anymore. Just to, can I, through the absolutely. chair, sorry, just to respond to that. I, I'm at an absolute agreement in terms of uh, supporting parents. I think what you're talking about is really doing a better job on, on, of communication. And right now, actually, as we speak, we have our kindergarten, um, we have a, an evening where we actually invite all of our students of, that are coming in with any kind of a, 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 a sorry, an, any kind of a, a ability challenge. They actually uh, do an information night. It used to be here, but now it's at Garibaldi. We usually draw about 30 to 50 parents that are coming in and part of that presentation does include talking about expectations, what our expectations are around inclusion, giving them opportunities and parameters for communication, how they can communicate. They get a presentation on who all of the different people are and all the avenues and the, la the layers and the steps that they can go through. But having said that, we still only reach the parents that are able to attend or choose to attend. So I think that's something that will always be an ongoing challenge. We need to do a better job always communicating with parents and getting to them. Sometimes it's through our administrators as well. And I agree with one of your slides around supporting our administrators. And we actually also do a lot of, uh, we call them toolbox series for administrators on both inclusion, special education, all areas. And I think that's something that we need to continue to do because I agree with you around the communication piece, we need to make sure that we do a good job communicating with parents and collaborating with them. Thank you so much. So um, we really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. And I think this is really important because it does point to some ways that we're informing our decision making process, the timing of certain decisions, um, budget processes and existing processes in place, including data collection tools and opportunities to improve um, that. So thank you so much, Kaylin. Um, and everyone. So our last um, presentation is by Vivica Ellis from All On Board. And two youth leaders that are working on us. Super, yes. Um, would you mind uh, introducing yourselves? Hi, I'm Vivica Ellis. Um, I'm an advocate with the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition. And uh, this is Crystal. My name is Crystal Chino. I am uh, a youth leader, part of the campaign. I am an alumni of Britannia Elementary and Secondary School. Um, and, uh, my name is Breezy Hartley, part of the All On Board campaign, um, and also alumni here to advocate. And I have a son at Bayview, who's in grade four. 
we're looking forward to that rebuild. <laughs> okay, welcome. So, thank you. Um, shall we just start? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. um, so I'm just going to give a very brief overview of our ask and hand um, hand things over to Breezy. Um, each of our they'll each speak for three minutes, and I'll do four minutes at the end. So our ask at this time, the All Aboard campaign, is calling for free transit for all children and youth zero to 18, um, a sliding scale pass based on income to accommodate diversity in income, and um, an immediate end to the ticketing of all minors, 0 to 18 within TransLink, and the introduction of community service as an option for adults, so that there are options instead of just the one fair infraction ticket. And at that, I'm going to hand it over to Breezy to explain some of what brings us to this ask. Okay. So um, we, all of us, or not all of us, some of us may know that our brains don't stop developing around age 25. So you hop on the bus to get to school um, or to get home safely. Um, and the police issue you a ticket to a youth um, who couldn't pay for um, various reasons. Um, so you turn 18, 19 and you start off in debt, $173 ticket. It keeps increasing over time to $275 per ticket and more. You can't get your license. You have bad credit, which limits getting housed, and especially for youth who desperately need it for youth fleeing um, abuse or other needs. Um, so parents who can't afford transit to um, extra school activities, um, since they could barely um, afford the activity in the first place, and then on top of that, there's um, transit. So working at McCreary Youth Council and Advisory Committee, the top three barriers facing youth in BC are mental health, depression and anxiety, which hobbies, passions, extra school activities, um, studies show help. And the third barrier is transit. I've also seen how youth who have hobbies and extra activities are less likely to use um, drugs for they are receiving healthy dopamine and do not need to resort to drugs for expression and acceptance. Um, and for youth who um, do conduct in such uh, behavior like drinking, um, may be ashamed to go call their parents and are trying to get home unsafely. So it's a matter of safety as well. Thank you. All right, thanks, Katie. Yeah, um, I'll be speaking over my experiences. So one of the issues was like funding money that we get through the centers. A lot of it goes to the bus tickets and um, fair evasion tickets if we do get them. I know there's some programs out there that are funded through the government to pay these fare evasion tickets and debt um, when we could be using it towards more activities and bringing in more youth to join these activities. Because I know um, at Britannia, a lot of the activities that we had, it was like a limited amount of space because of we're using it, a lot of it towards the bus tickets. Um, another issue is that Families and youth, they sometimes can't do the extracurricular activities. For example, like basketball tournaments, a lot of them can't even get to it because they can't. <coughs> so affordability is a big issue, especially in my community. And um, I've seen like a lot of families um, are choosing between groceries or paying for bus tickets. Sometimes like they can't even send their kids to school because they can't afford it. Or either they can't bring their young children on the bus because the parents can't afford bus for themselves, which in turn is a safety issue because you're sending seven to 12 year olds on the bus by themselves, which is not safe. Um,
here you're suggesting um, and reduced. You're suggesting the second to the two, the second two sentences of this of paragraph four, right? Oh, I have something different. Sorry, can I just come in with a process question? I think we're we're struggling a little bit here. Um, I think you said you have we have an eight to twelve week um, time frame, and I think you you also said that there are these mo these motions aren't as passed by council. There were some amendments that were beneficial at council, so maybe we can take forward the idea that there is the intent to have motions. We can pick up from what council's done because I think there's strength in the VSB matching what council has done, you know, because we're we're all working in Vancouver. And coming back to committee with that intent, you know, maybe um, to have a further discussion on that, um, because it will be within the time frame. And I think we could have a more efficient um, use of our committee time and um, have um, better input from our representatives as well. You know, they you know they didn't come today contemplating that uh, that we'd be crafting a motion at the committee. Thank you so much for that process piece, um, Trustee <coughs> Fraser. Um, that's a really great point. Um, I'm wondering if others have any other feedback in terms of our actions now and Trustee Parrott, since it was your action. Well, it hasn't got a seconder yet, um, but if it has a seconder, then then the motion can be postponed or referred or whatever. I, I just think it's an easy ask. I think it's easy for for us to recommend it because we're school teacher. We, you know, we're we're a school board. We're, we, our 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 group, our kids, right? So I think it's an easy ask for us to make uh, a recommendation on uh, right now. I, you know, it could be a simpler. I just I think we should show our support that yes, we agree that transit should be free for for youth zero to eighteen. That um, that it should be a sliding scale for low-income people, and that it um, that they're not the ticket the tickets go away disappear. I think we can do that. I don't think we need to. Um, I don't think we need to send it go away, come back to another committee meeting, and then and then it has to go to the board. So it's you know it's that step those steps that I don't think we need. I think I think that we probably can agree to those three basic things. Okay, um, I've got actually uh, Carmen, Alan, and then back to Vivica. Mm -hmm. uh, through the chair, um, I, I agree, Barb, that in general we agree with this. I think I'm just worried about, as we've seen in the past when we try to craft a motion on the spot, we might miss certain nuances or there's things, uh, overall the sentiment we all agree with, but I'm wondering if we can make a recommendation to bring a motion at the next board meeting, which we do have one on Monday. Could we do that, you know, and that would give people a little bit more time to think about what it is we want to bring forward. Or as, as Vivica said, the timeline isn't that tight. We could even wait till, you know, the next meeting. Just, I just think it, we, we, it's difficult to try to craft a motion in this moment without providing ourselves with a chance to do a little bit more research and see what the council full motion was. Thank you, Trustee Cho. Alan? Thank you, Chairperson. I, I agree with Trustee Cho. Um, I think we, we set up that we do precedence that we don't, a delegation comes and then we, we draft a motion right away, go to the board. Um, I have a motion myself, but I was saving it for after asking the questions and asking um, that we have staff time. Um, the under 18 to me is, is something that has been discussed um, on past boards and I can, I can, I'm very comfortable, but for the, for the, the board and the committee, I think it has to, it should pass through some, some lenses. Um, I do support uh, a lot of the general direction, but not all the general directions. Um, and to have a discussion with the delegation is, is we've never done that before. Um, it, so it sets up precedent setting. Um, sliding scale is something that we need to discuss together um, because to me that you know it's not directly related to to the district and 
children in the school so I mean indirectly it does but um, you know I have thoughts of a focus on something specific but with regards to trustee Fraser's comments that um, I don't think we should be drafting motions or I like I have my own here um, at a committee and having to have that discussion so I think we should I think it is time sensitive and it has to be done within definitely within the eight to 12 weeks and given our process our process there is delays between between committee and the board and all that so we have to be cognizant of that but to have that discussed the motion discussed tonight is I, I don't think it's the appropriate time and then, yeah. well so chairperson so there wasn't a seconder so I wonder if you could um, if you could see if there's agreement to this from the committee mm -hmm. does the committee agree that uh, we should we request staff to bring forward a recommendation to the next Vancouver School Board meeting to support the all on board campaign do we have agreement on that okay. I don't think it should be a recommendation from staff I think if the committee is going to decide then it's trustees on the committee mm -hmm. But it could be a recommendation from trustees on the committee to create to wording for a motion. Okay. So I'm not sure what I've, I've, I've lost what you were saying. You're asking staff to ask recommend staff to. I thought that's what you said, Jan. You would ask staff to bring a, a recommendation, um, the wording of a motion to the school board meeting. Okay. Right. So I'm, I'm just thinking recommendation is different from wording for a motion. Oh, okay. That's what I meant, recommendation. So if I could uh, clarify, so what we can do tonight is recommend this to move forward to the next board meeting, which is on Monday. Um, and we can agree that we're in principle um, supportive of this idea um, based on the committee members tonight. And if anyone does have reservations to please voice that. Um, and that that's what we can accomplish at this stage. I wouldn't support a recommendation to take it straight to the next board meeting. I'd recommend it coming back to committee so there could be a more robust discussion at committee with our, our representatives before it gets to the board meeting. Um, Trustee Wong? Further to that, um, well, first of all, I have to figure out when is the next February 6th. February 6th. Okay, February 6th is part. <coughs> um, so specifically to the February 6th meeting. But I think it's important to ask, ask staff tonight's board meeting, tonight's committee meeting, uh, if staff has anything they uh, need to add to this or um, when it comes back to the next committee meeting, is it simply a committee meeting and staff <coughs> doesn't have a specific um, uh, direction on this? So I don't think it's, I don't think it's, uh, it's not affecting negatively the any financial uh, implications or anything so just asking staff and they don't have to answer tonight if they don't want to um if they have any input if not by the way we should we should have this discussion out of committee but but if it comes back to the next committee uh, which i support rather than trying to everyone bring their own motions if we can think of a process of some either the chair comes up with um, a motion i'm not sure if it's uh, trustee parrot's motion my motion or amalgamation of a number of thoughts thank you so much um trustee long yep susan so hearing really robust support for the initiative overall um, I think from staff's perspective, um, the timeline that would make the most sense is to bring it back to your next committee meeting, only because your next board meeting is on Monday. Um, and if we're going to reach out to the city to have alignment with what it is that they've moved, um, it would be good to try to find out from city staff what the exact wording of their motion is to see if this board or this committee wants to adopt what the city is saying directly or change their motion. Um, so that there's alignment and full support for the work that you're trying to do. So if the committee's agreeable, February 6th isn't far away. It's still within the timeline of what you're trying to accomplish. That still gives it an opportunity then to go back to the board and staff can then spend the time crafting a motion for you. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, any other questions or comments from the committee members? Uh, yeah, back to Trustee Fraser. I, I like um, Alan's point that 
um, we should focus on education. I think the key phrase it used was access to education. I, I think if we, we as a school district could work, I would suggest we as a school district work within those within that parameter. Thank you, um, Trustee Perry. And sorry, Chairperson, I didn't realize that the next committee meeting was February the 6th. I thought it was like a month from now, so I, I apologize. Oh, well, that's perfect. No, thank you so much for the discussion. Um, so are there any further comments just looking around the room? Um, thank you for the excellent discussion and comments on process and making this as valuable as possible. You, we have taken a lot of your time as well. And we appreciate all the effort you put into your presentations. Um, and thank you for bringing the school board into the mix of, of your work as well. Um, clearly, we can see the link um, and there's opportunities to move forward. So really appreciate that. Um, thank you. So just thank you so much, Chair, for listening. Thank you so much. And the, the discussion, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's it, I guess. The next meeting then. So um, that's all of the items for this evening. I know for the next meeting, um, Trustee Lois Chan Petty um, has a little bit of an intro and outro just to make sure we hear the voice of everyone. So I just want to make sure um, uh, that's the end of our delegations for tonight. Um, but I wanted to just um, pass that to you. We wanted to share that for next time or um, you're referring to the, the uh, check-in, check-out thing. Would you, um, I guess we have a few moments, we could do a quick check-out. Yeah, that sounds great. Would you like me to sure. kind of introduce what that is? Absolutely. Um, so the idea is to just go around a room and um, say a quick thing about how perhaps how you felt about the meeting maybe you have further questions and maybe you're satisfied or dissatisfied about something and you can just um this is just the space to say that um without um and, and the and the intention isn't to have like a back and forth dialogue it's to perhaps um connect people who may have shared the same feelings, um, have a, an answer to a question that you um, are stating. Um, so it's just a really quick, like, um, I, um, for example, I might say, um, this was a very um, beneficial meeting for me. Um, I, uh, in particular, really um, learned a lot from uh, Galen's presentation. I thought it was very, um, fair, um, even-handed, um, even though it can be such an emotional thing for, um, you know, families who are involved in um, trying to get their student to um, go to school. Um, such a basic thing for most of us that um, <coughs> we can, I understand how, how difficult it can be. Um, and so just that is an example of what one might say. Um, it can be just a statement of gratitude, it can be whatever you want to say. You can just say, I don't want to say anything past um, as well. So, <laughs> um, so I've done my checkout and um, we could go around or we can do popcorn style. It doesn't have to be very well. Yes. So. And pass is an option. Yes, and pass is an option. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't I can provide some information about the question um, Amanda asked around the poverty reduction plan and the motion that was passed in September 2015 was that the VSB renew and re reiterate its request that the BC government develop and implement a provincial poverty reduction plan. Mm -hmm. So um, and here we are, we have time passed the motion and look at happened. So <laughs> um, I, I think that might address what you had and I, I really appreciate the discussion that was around the table today particularly from our stakeholder representatives, because trustees talk all the time. I can just add that the BSTA is always um, happy to be part of the discussion. Uh, I thought it was great to hear from some community um, advocates. It was um, these, these people out in the community working hard and willing to come forward to this committee and share. And I just have a technical question. Are we going to do information item requests still? Because I have a request for the next meeting. Can I do that now or 
Um, first, I would like to request a report from the Joint Adult Ed Board Special Education Committee at the next Committee 3 meeting. Um, I appreciated hearing three different talks about different ways of increasing equity in the district, and I'm hoping action comes from them. Looking forward to the next committee meeting. Stakeholder inputs with direct access um, and knowledge of, of students in our system with regards to free transit. <laughs> Uh, I just really enjoyed hearing again from the groups in the community and just seeing the passion that people have. I certainly understand where you're coming from with a child. I have a child with a Q designation as well, and it is challenging, but also seeing the two students or former students here that were presenting about transit and how they want to make a difference for the next uh, group of youth coming up behind them, I just think it's really impressive. So thank you. Yeah, um, similar to Carmen's comment, it was really cool to see um, certain um, groups helping students like access education was just like the bear um what we should be reaching and um it was i wish vivica was still here because i'd like to personally thank her for coming in here um actually um presenting an idea to have free transit for um zero students from zero to 18 years of age because um being a student um, myself and also witnessing a lot of other students struggle with certain payments. Um, it's it'd be really it'd be really nice to just have one less thing to think about um, regarding payments. So yeah, very nice. Um, we had a meeting this morning about equity, and so some mm -hmm. of the conversations that I was listening to this evening, I was reflecting on comments that were made this morning about equitable access, and that resonated this evening with me too. It's interesting, I was going to say that in all of the presentations, equity came up and I and I would really love to have a conversation about what that means to all of us. What, what does equity, equitable access mean? And see if we can come up with a common definition of it. So following right along with what you said. Thank you and thanks. I really appreciate this opportunity to actually hear from folks in the community and thank you um, to Trustee uh, Chan Penley for bringing about a bit of a closure because um, it's great also to be able to hear and thank staff and folks present in the audience as well as the stakeholders here. Just appreciation for the delegations uh, that came in to uh, present uh, this evening. Uh, thank you all for doing that and inspiring great conversation amongst uh, committee members. Thank you. <laughs> Just to reiterate, I think what everybody else has said, it's, it's always good to think about when delegations are presenting, how can we do better for kids? So it always makes you think, and I think that's important. And again, um, similar to what Suzanne was saying, just I, I kept thinking about coming at it from the lens of uh, equity and excellence, and ultimately that it's really interesting hearing from delegations because it's, it's different lenses, but it ultimately is coming to that same common cause that we're all here for around the equity and excellence for all our kids. Yeah. Didn't forget about the folks in the back here. We have an escape. I appreciate hearing about the uh, transit challenges. As someone who takes transit many times a day, I'm always perplexed at the challenges or the that certain bus drivers take on. A choice in who they're actually going to request uh, <coughs> fare from. I travel in the downtown every day. So that was interesting. Appreciation for listening to all the diverse opinions and ideas. Yeah, just uh, it's good to see that uh, the community takes the interest in the work that we do here at the district and uh, they're so passionate about it. It's interesting to hear. Um, uh, presenters talk about transit, especially because I worked at transit before. So um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a great idea and uh, it's exciting to see that other organizations are supporting it as well and where, where it will lead to in the future. I always uh, like the opportunity to hear from different people on different perspectives. So. Thanks everyone. So we'll see you excellent. at the next um, February 6th meeting, 6.30, same time, same place. <laughs> Almost the same time.